It's time for the Wrestling Perspective Podcast. I'm Dennis Farrell. That guy next to me rocking that sweet throwback WWE shirt. Is that recording artist Lars Fredrickson? It sure is. And it would be WWF, Dennis. That was the era. So it was before entertainment, before they kicked the <laughs> F out. Can, can you stand up, show that shirt off a second? Oh, my God. Well, that's sweet. Where can people get that? Well, it's from my friends who, uh, a company called Too Sweet Merch. Uh, but this is an older shirt, but I'm sure that if you hit them up, they would probably make you one. Well, listen, uh, I, I definitely will hit them up. I saw, I saw Hobbs eye in that thing, and I don't like the way he looked at it. So we may have to fight over if there's like <laughs> one left. Sad. <laughs> I, I, I don't say. <laughs> well, you know, I'll, 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 I'm going to get Will one, but you're going to have to do something, you know, pretty mar- mar- uh, special, Dennis, if you want one as well. I will show Will, Will and I are old friends, man. Yes. We'll go way back. Well, okay. listen, with Double or Nothing on the Horizon, was it May 29th? I'm <clears> all excited. <throat> Still, the card being ironed out. We are excited to sit here with Will Powerhouse Hobbs. Will Hobbs, uh, listen, before even Lars got here, we were talking about you and Lars and your connection. Bay Area boys hanging out on this sad little podcast. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me, man. This is dope. Like I said, I've known Lars for a while. I've seen him come to a lot of independent shows like All Pro Wrestling in um, San Francisco Bay Area. So Plus, we got a lot of mutual friends. So amen to that. Me? No, no, I didn't think so. <laughs> I was, I was going to say you're one of them now. But... <laughs> well, uh, that's debatable. <laughs> I may be a friend of Hobbs, but Lars doesn't like me. No, that's not true. It's technically community service that he's doing hanging out with me. So that's why he's still here. Uh, let me jump in because we've got a lot to unpack with you. This is one of these interviews where we are excited to sit here and talk to you. And I'm going to lead off with something that I've been interested. I haven't seen anything from your side, but growing up, I was a massive Doom fan. Uh, Hacksaw Bush to read was one of my all time favorite people. When he passed away, I saw a lot of articles talking about how Butch Reed was a massive fan of yours. And, uh, I wouldn't use the word gifted and I may be playing loose and fast with this, the rest of this question, but uh, he, he said he would be somewhat honored if you were to take up the uh, hacksaw mantle. Were there ever any real thoughts in your mind about doing that? And uh, have you ever actually talked to Butch Reed before all this? Um, So I was in, so I'll, I'll, I'll backtrack. So I was dropping my son, Bam Bam off at uh, preschool one morning and I were at a red light. And I get this like Instagram tag, you know, that Butch Reed has an Instagram and he tagged my, my, like one of my first shirts on it. And, you know, said, this, this is a new powerhouse. And, and I, I geeked out over it so much. And then um, I sent the message to him and then he replied back to the message and we exchanged phone numbers, but we actually never got the, the chance to, to speak. Um, only we only chatted just through Insta, uh, Instagram messaging, and um, you know I was told by him that he was a huge fan, and that that was an honor to me because I had the old WCW Galoob Doom figures, so <laughs> that 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 meant that meant the world to me. And I recently just bought the the Ron Simmons and the Butch Reed one at a toy convention um, until my daughter got a hold of it and started chewing on it. Uh, but uh, the fact that he said he was a massive fan, that meant so much to me. And the I actually found out he passed away when I was uh, in the Dallas airport. Uh, his son sent me a, a heartfelt message. That, uh, you know what? His dad was unable to speak, but when he saw me in my in-ring work, you know, he smiled. So that... That's something that I'll, I will always hold dear to my heart. And if I ever have the opportunity to carry on the Hacksaw name, I, I'll do that 100%. So that's that's well, one of my goals. Well, and Butch Reed was, you know, one hell of an incredible talent. And I think you are one and the same. One of the things I wanted to know, and since we're on the topic of names, because when I used to see you on the indies, and what I was always kind of curious about, you, you, you were willpower. Right. Yeah. So you get to AEW 
and then there's a name change and then there's another name change. There's mm -hmm. powerhouse. Well, you know, so was this something that you caught, was this, was this a decision made by you or was this something that the company was saying, Hey, you know, uh, we think you should be doing this. Uh, well, so originally when I first came into AEW, I did, I did the enhancement work and, you know, I was, you know, what, what, what you saw me as is willpower on the independent scene. And, Tony came up to me. He's like, you're, you're such a powerhouse. You know, we're going to call you powerhouse Hobbs. And he actually said he was thinking of one word names. And one of the first names that he said was hacksaw. And then he's like, no, he's like, you're a powerhouse. And so we've been rolling with that ever since. And, you know, I've, I've mentioned to Tony a few times, if the opportunity comes up to become hacksaw, you know, well, there's some possibly that, that can happen. Well, but I don't know if you know this, but so Powerhouse is an old Bay Area hardcore band. So I know anytime, that. so there you go. But it's still all in the family, you know what I mean? Because yeah. you're a Bay Area guy, I'm a Bay Area guy. This band was, you know, kind of invented this, you know, Bay Area hardcore. And so when every time I see that, I, I you know, I know maybe you didn't know, but it's like it's almost like a triple knot, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's but that's it's dope. really cool. that, that's, that's dope. I like that. We are big on the evolution of characters on this podcast. We talk about it a lot with, with athletes. And when you first got started out to where you are now, is this kind of where you envisioned yourself? Because uh, as Laura said, he was, he followed your career through the Bay area. In my mind, I picture you showing up and you're like, you know, will the lawyer Hobbs. And then you're like, will the trash man Hobbs. And then as you grow into who you are, what was the evolution from where you started to where you are now? Yeah, I just think well, from when I first started is this, I, I I'll be honest with you, I didn't know what was going on. It's just still <laughs> trying to, <laughs> trying to find that niche, you know, what, what actually works and what suits me and my own, you know, personality, you know, just bringing me to, to this character. You know, I, I say that this character, Powerhouse Hobbs, it's not a character. 99% of the time, that's me, um, depending on what type of mood I'm in. But uh, just the, the evolution of it is it, it took me a while to, to find it. And I still don't even think I've scratched the surface mm. of, of this character. You know, I'm still developing things trying things so well do you feel that like you know you, with the stable that you were kind of involved with um and you know the aggressive uh character that you've been given mm -hmm. do you feel like that in any way sort of elevated you as far as how your character was going to sort of unfold or did you feel like this is kind of just what i've been doing anyway so you know what i mean a, a little bit of both. Um, I, mean, I was what I'm doing now is kind of what I was doing on the independent scene a little bit, but now it's just on a, a, a bigger national, worldwide platform. Um, and so I'm I'm happy with what I'm doing. It, it, I mean, it, it's me. Um, of course, I'm you know with being in Team Taz with Ricky Starks and and Hook, and you know having Taz in our corner, it, it does letting me add my own little personal seasoning to the mix watching you i feel like you're on the cusp of being the face of this company you you have all the tools you are going out there you're delivering every night but in the back of your mind what do you think you have to do then to take that next step from being will Ho will hobbs part of team taz to will hobbs AEW world champion there's, there's going to be a point where I'm going to have to, to step away on my own you know uh, who knows when that will happen and, you know I just I just think that next step for me is just I think what was going to come up for me is just I'm just going to have to to show a, a whole new kick ass different style you know I mean you can tell I'm having fun in the ring and when I got someone in the hole and I'm kicking the kicking the shit out of them. So I mean it's just it's just I'm 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 having fun. So I just I just that I don't like I don't I don't know what that next step is gonna be. It's just it's just gonna happen. 
Well, you know, I mean, it feels like as soon as you walked into that company, you got a lot of opportunities. I mean, oh yeah, you got a lot. You got a lot of FaceTime. You're in the ring with some some you know, obviously very high profile names. Um, when you're going into that, you know, because you've been a, an indie guy up until that point, like, uh, you know, how what's the different mindset walking in, you know, to an AEW and getting these high profile sort of opportunities? Or, you know, what's your mindset with that? Because it's obviously a lot different than the indie scene because you got cameras you got to work with. How do you get used to that whole thing? Um, I just think that for me, when, when I when I first came in, I kind of scoped out everything. Like, I figured out early where all the cameras are. And, you know, just when that red light is on, that means that it's, it's on you. So I figured out, figured that out pretty quick. Um, but I, I just I, I've had I had this talk with my dad and it's just like I kind of knew that I was meant to do this so mm. just being out there I mean I, I don't get I mean I get nervous when I go out but it's not like a oh my god I'm gonna I'm scared I'm gonna mess up nervous it's like okay and anticipating nervous I'm about to have fun type of thing so it's it's, it's coming natural to me because i i really feel with, with all my heart that i was meant to do this this might be kind of a heavy question but mm-hmm. we had uh carrie morton on last week or this week depending on when you're listening and he talked about there was a period in time where he resented wrestling and maybe even his dad a little bit because of the travel schedule and listen to a lot of interviews with you family is super important to you yeah how do you balance that with your family of having to be on the road, making a living, doing dates, but yet trying to be there for your kids and your family? Uh, so it, it's pretty easy with my my 16-year-old because, mm. uh, you know, dad has to go to work. Dad has to provide, and he knows that this has always been dad's dream and that I'm always a, a phone call away. And thank goodness for, for FaceTime. Um, yeah. It's harder with my my four year old and my soon to be two year old because they quite don't understand. But Arn Anderson gave me the best advice, and it's just when you get home, you're super dad, and you treat every day like it's Christmas. And it's not necessarily going out buying and things. It's just doing whatever they want to do. What's going to make them happy? Um, so I mean, I, I I didn't have my dad around a whole lot. Um, when I was growing up, my grandparents raised us, but I always keep in mind that I don't want my kids to ever feel like dad is too tired to, to read to them or go in the backyard and play with them or take them out. Um, anybody that knows me knows when I get home, I, I do whatever my kids want to do. Like we'll go to the trampoline park, we'll go to the park and ride bikes. Yeah, um, I'm helping, um, well, I'm assistant coach with my sons t-ball team so i mean it just it, it takes up a lot of time so it's just there's not enough hours in the day but i make it work well you know i've been talking about this for the last couple of years and i really do still believe we're in it it's the golden age the second really golden age of wrestling because you have so many different companies doing so many different styles and so many different things you um obviously can get in there with anybody and have a great match i mean uh, you know, I really feel like you were uh, really seen and elevated after that CM Punk match. Oh, yeah. But yeah. How, how, how much do you still train? How much are you still going out there and trying to adapt to different styles? Who were those trainers to begin in the beginning as well? Um, so when I first started at All Pro Wrestling, it was uh, Jekyll's the Jester was my, well, my first trainer. Um, then we had J.J. Perez. And then, you know, we had the guests like Robert Thompson, Michael Modis, Donovan yeah. Morgan that, you know, that came in. So those are kind of my, my foundation when I got started. And um, there's a great school in um, near San Francisco, uh, West Coast Pro Wrestling Academy. You know, Vinny Massaro, who's great, go in there and he has different styles yes yes <laughs> and you know and get to learn from him so you know it's still important to to keep that ring rust off uh, while i'm 
while I've been with AEW guys like Dustin Rhodes, Mark Henry, Big Show, Arn Anderson, FTR, Dean Malenko, uh, Billy Gunn, like I've had so much help from all those guys. So it's can't fail. <laughs> so we occasionally ask this question and with a lot of NFL players, you know, they have their welcome to their NFL moment. What was your welcome to the wrestling industry <laughs> moment where maybe someone knocked you on your ass or you were in the ring with a legend that, that moment I've never been it? knocked on my ass. What are you talking uh, about? <laughs> Come on now. That's what my man. What are you man. talking about? What, are you, yeah, what talking the fuck about? are you talking about? Damn. Guys? Damn. I did not do my homework, guys. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> but but you're welcome to the industry moment. Maybe you looked across the ring and there was a Hall of Famer or just that moment where you go, holy shit, I'm I'm doing this. So there's two. So I was in my maybe seventh month of training and they always told us, you know, get some generic gear and some boots. I had a, a wrestler uh, give me a pair of boots were the size same size shoe he's like here you take these boots give me a couple hundred bucks okay cool i got some boots to train in you know i'm kind of feeling like this is real order some generic tights off of ebay um and we had a battle royal and of course i was still doing ring crew setting up and one of the trainers was like hey you got your gear with you and i'm like yeah he's like okay we had a no show for the battle royal you're in it and I was like, oh, man, I was trying to call a bunch of people, trying to get them to come out. Nobody showed up. But when I got in that battle royal, it seemed like every vet in there wanted to chop me, get a hold of me. <laughs> and I, I, I was with it. It was like, OK. And probably maybe about, I want to say, a month or two before, we learned how to go over the top rope backwards. And that happened to me. Uh, it was Larry Blackwell. He's like all right i'm gonna give you a chop take the clothesline go over chop me i sold it went over went over clean backwards that was my moment my first moment right there and i got to the back and all my classmates and my class were congratulating me it was like oh man that was so cool and the second moment was probably uh arthur ash against cm punk like that right there that was huge over what was it 20 something thousand people that were there and just the uh, how much that match meant to me you know with my with my mom passing away um about a month before and he knew it and he wanted to make sure that that match was for her um he i can't say this about him enough like he's, he's such such a great dude he sits down with me to this day and watches my matches with me um but when his music hit and you just feel that energy from, from the crowd, he's standing up on the top rope and he looked at me and I'm looking at him and I read his lips and he was like, okay, motherfucker. And I'm like, looking at him, I'm like, all right, like, <laughs> bitch is real. Like, let's go. I'm like, all right, we, we going to do this shit. So that, that was a, a moment right there. So and I, and I had other moments, but I, I placed those two at uh, right up at the top. And another one that's, that's real close was uh, I didn't even get signed yet to AEW and Tony put me in that all out battle royal. And it was on September 5th, which was the anniversary of uh, my brother's passing. It was a 10 year anniversary. So that was like another moment that meant a lot to me that it let me know that I was supposed to be here and just all the, the reactions from, from fans. So. Well, you know, knowing your story and and knowing like who you are and you a little bit, I know our lives, our personal lives have paralleled in so many ways, whether, you know, <clears throat> we've talked about it or not. One of the things I will say on with your CM Punk match, after that match, texting with Punker, he was more concerned about if you were happy with it or not. And that's what kind yeah. of guy, you know. Yeah. I, oh, man, I just... Uh the words he gave me and, and, you know, just, and I've, I've told a handful of people about uh, what he, after he got the pen and, you know, he leaned over and whispered something in my ear and he, and I've told a handful of people, like I said, and 
he told me, he's like, this is for your mom. Mm. And, and that just, that just meant so much. And uh, yeah, I was, you know, I wrestled CM Punk, can anybody take that away from me? No. His first match no, on no. television in what, seven years? He, like, I mean, it was the perfect, honestly, it was the perfect match. Um, but my question, I guess, would be, you know, to kind of come back to what I was trying to get at, the parallel lives. Um, growing up, I feel like for me, being where I was grew up at, it kind of gave me sort of, uh, it, it, it gave me the, I kind of, it was kind of a do or die situation to do something, to get out of this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I feel like knowing your story a little bit, that was kind of the same situation for you. Do you feel like that desire and that passion to get a better life is still there for you or are you kind of like okay i've made it no i i i haven't made it <laughs> um because all this can be taken away in a in a, in a blink of an eye I, I, you know um took me a while to get here um but i don't want to go back to to how i live you know i just grew up on government aid which i'm, I'm not afraid to 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 say um I wore hand-me-downs, uh, mm -hmm. shopped at the Goodwill, Salvation Army, you know, but I'm, I'm not afraid of to talk about how I grew up and it's, it's still motivating for me because uh, I've been in the house without power. I've been in the house where we had to open up the oven to heat the house, <laughs> you know, so I've I've been through all been through all that, man, and I, I don't want to go back to it. That's that's mm -hmm. always in the back of my mind, which what, it makes me want to work harder and harder. And I don't want my children to 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 go through that. Um, they do know the the meaning of hard work, you know, but I don't I don't want them to to ever grow up how I grew up, and, and it's always motivating to me. Uh, I tell people most of my friends that I grew up are in the penitentiary or at Skyline Cemetery, mm -hmm. you know, which I'm not sure you know where that's at. Uh, oh, I know, I know. You know, you know, so it's you're either <laughs> in jail or you're in the grave, so. And I had some strong-willed grandparents from a small town in Mississippi that made sure that wasn't gonna happen. That That's actually a perfect lead-in for my next question because for Lars and I, and it sounds like for you, wrestling was an escape for us. It wasn't just something we sat down and watched, but we got lost in it. We forgot about whatever was going on outside of, for at least me, the little 13-inch black and white TV that I got to watch wrestling on. Uh, when you think of those days, when you think of the wrestling you watch, what are some of the moments in the past that pop in your head that make you go, that that's wrestling for me? Um, so let me touch on that. So wrestling was huge in my house like huge because my grandparents moved from Mississippi to San Francisco and they lived above this little like mom and pop grocery store like right across the street from the cow palace so they would okay. always go see like Ray Stevens, <clears throat> Pat Patterson, Peter Mavia, Pepper Gomez like it was on before I was even thought about <laughs> so they would take my <laughs> they would take my dad and my uh, aunts and uncles and cousins to, to matches um but when we all sat down and watched it together we all just got sucked in it you know it was something we all got hyped up about we had dinners around pay-per-views and you know we all ate breakfast together when superstars came on or Sundays we watched uh main event or you know Saturday night so we all watched it together but for me I think it might have been the first show I remember going to to the Cow Palace, like I remember, I was real young. I was, I remember, oh man, it was it was Brent and Yoko in a in a cage uh, for the WWF title back then, and so it's just like I knew I wanted to do something then. Um, I would. I would go to like said Mervyn's or the department store, my grandma and all the clothes on the clothes rack. Like I would take her glasses and put them on and pretend the clothes were fans and start slapping the, the clothes, <laughs> you know? So 
but it's yeah. just man like I, I remember like we had a bunch of old vhs tapes like i like my grandparents recorded all the clash of the champions so i would watch that they were I had copies of a lot of pay-per-views, so we always had stuff. I was watching a lot of the old stuff before I was, you know, up to the, the modern stuff. Who who made the uh, the biggest impression to you first watching it on TV? There's a few. Uh, Harlem Heat made an impression on me, just got how they talked. Yeah, and you know, just my, my grandma was notorious for calling. If you if you messed up, she was notorious for calling you a sucker. And, uh, <laughs> you know, she, she she reminded me of Aunt Esther from Sanford and Son. Like That's you would awesome. say something smart, she would say, "You better watch it, sucker." <laughs> uh, you know what you say to me, sucker. You know, so those guys, um, Brett, um, Mark Henry, the whole Nation of Domination. You know, oh, yeah. the, the Rock, Stone Cold. So there, there's a whole fleet of guys that made an impression on me i think pretty much like growing up for me like maybe every week i was trying to imitate a different wrestler mm. you know there were times i would walk around the house doing this you know thinking i was dean malenko you know, <laughs> was just, i was in my own world as a kid how do you honor that and still be unique because if i was a pro wrestler which you know, I'm 44 and I still do all that stuff thinking I'm cool. And uh, I don't know if I being a pro, if I was had the opportunity, if I could be original, you're original, but you, once again, you're a guy who learning about you is who loves to honor the past. Do you, yeah. do you find it hard with, I don't want to use the word gimmick infringement. Do you find it hard to be original, but yet still pay homage? No, I mean, I mean, you look at look at my gear now. I mean, it's I, I like the you know the whole singlet idea came from why I switched to a single was to you know be like Doctor Death Steve Williams. Mm. That was the reason why I got the singlet. And I'm like, okay, well, how could I pay homage to to Harlem Heat? I threw flames on my gear. You know, how can I pay homage to to Taz? You know, I got the FTW on my back so it's you know i just throw small little bits and pieces there and you know i still add add my touch to it so but just do you feel to, oh, sorry no go ahead go ahead well i was going to ask you you know because it's one of the things that i always kind of want to touch on because each wrestler has a different opinion on it but you know the creative freedom that you guys have these days um where you're able to kind of come with ideas and you're in a company that sort of, you know, welcomes not, not only new ideas, but like creative ideas about, you know, the wrestlers. Mm -hmm. um, do you, do you see yourself in a place where maybe, uh, how do I ask this? Do you see, do you, do you feel like you could be in any other environment and still become who you want to be i don't know i don't know um i know with my current environment like being with AEW, like i feel complete 100 percent comfortable approaching tony khan and be like hey i have this idea and either we'll say okay we can give it a shot or maybe let's not try that right now because i've had ideas that i gave him that we tried and it worked and there's been times where he's like no let, let's let's try it this way and i'm i'm totally cool with that uh, you know just i've never had a boss that will genuinely listen to my ideas and you know and, and try to understand it and try to look at look at it the way i'm seeing it um uh, he's just not going to be like no i don't want to do that so he's never shot anything down and just like you know i've approached uh someone that's huge at aew QT, qt marshall like I, I approached him with ideas like you think this might work and he's like well you know maybe you can do this and this to it and, and tweak it out and so you know that that's one person that i don't want to forget that has uh i want to throw it out there that's, that's helped me out especially like with coming up with ideas friend of the show qt by the way uh, you know, we're in a new age now where wrestlers and social media and 
you know, there's a balance between being Will Hobbs, the wrestler, Will Hobbs, the person, mm -hmm. when you approach social media, how, what is your mindset towards it? And how do you use it to further your career? Um, I do use it to, pro to promote anything I'm doing. That, that, that's what social media is for me, promote what you're doing. Um, I promote my workouts, promote my matches. Um, sometimes I want to throw my kids out there, you know, so and talk about dad life. But it, it, it's a great tool. And, you know, I just think that some people don't know how to use it correctly. Just what I mean by that is just the 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 hate on there yeah. sometimes it does get overwhelming and you just you just don't want to repeat the shit so but it, it, it's a great tool well what was the uh, you know you just said something that's pretty interesting to me because when you do kind of get bigger and, and more into the spotlight and have more high profile things happen in your life you're always going to get a certain sect of the population that comes at you and, and thinks that they need to humble you um mm -hmm. As an experience, you know, you know, getting, you know, into the this environment where you are getting more high, more high profile, did you, was this something that was like kind of shocking at first or were you kind of like, whatever, I don't really give a shit? Um, it, it was a little bit shocking. Then it got to the point it was like, whatever, I just, I, I know what I should put and what I shouldn't put out there. Um, I'm not going to put out something then they regret it. If I'm going to put out something, I'm going to stand 100% by it. So I just think that people that are on a higher platform need to be more careful what they put out. So I kind of double check <laughs> what I want to put out sometimes, you know. Well, I'm not saying that I see a lot of negative stuff about you out there anyways. I, I, I don't think I've ever seen one. I mean, ain't think. nobody cooler than me, man. I don't put out well, that's negative. true. I, that's I, I true. Tell, I tell the truth. <laughs> I guess I'm just wondering, it's, you know, you know, for me, like I just ignore it. Just It's kind of just, it's it's a whole different other kind of world. So it is, it is. I mean, uh, my grandpa always told me, he's like, not everybody's going to like what you do or what you say. And you don't, you don't got to please everybody. So if I put something only that, out, and someone doesn't like it, okay, well, block me, mute me, you know. Well, obviously, you must care about it a little bit if you want to respond to it. So, well, and there's that old saying that if you're not if you're not pissing people off, and you're then you're doing something wrong. I yeah, digress. That's true. Dennis, your question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, kind of on the same lines, it seems like you're one of those few people. And I listen. I, I I'm not on your side of things. But everything I see seems to be a lot mostly positive about Will Hobbs. Is is that something you kind of take pride in? Like, hey, listen, I go out there and the majority of the people out there, you know, support me, support whether I'm a heel or a face, I go out there and I entertain. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 any positive feedback, anybody's going to feel good about, you know, so mm -hmm. I, I do feel good about it. But whatever I put out, I'm not out to to please anybody is it's it's for me and, you know i put out my whole i put out my body transformation in the past 18 months i got a lot of hate on that shit and it was just okay well you know i'm proud of how i changed my body in the, the past 18 months you know and it, it it took off like i said it pissed a lot of people off some people didn't like it oh well you got way too many muscles slurs I mean, you know, I'm I'm pissed off at him now. Me too. I'm now mad. Yeah, you know, yeah. Now I'm <laughs> mad at you. Hey, you get mad at me for working hard, want to better my <laughs> right. career. Like, get get the hell out of here. Get out of here. Just move along. Um, okay, so future ambitions, and I know you're a very ambitious ambitious cat. So yes, what I want to know is where are your sights at? At this moment, I mean, you 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 you're with Team Taz. You're yeah. you're st still kind of got a, a a giant foothold there. Like, mm -hmm. where do you go? I mean, where do you want to go? The task right now is for Ricky Starks and I to beat the living hell out of Jurassic Express and take those tag titles. That's the goal right now. Um, but eventually, I will be TNT champion. Uh, um, personal goal of mine is to be the first. African-American AEW world champion and 
any title I get. I'm gonna. I know I know how to fight, and I know what it's like to to starve and struggle. And it, it, any title I get, it's gonna be hell for anybody to take that away from me. But I, I plan on being a big name, being around for a long time. That, that's always has been my goal. Um, I, ever since I wanted to become a professional wrestler, like I want people to remember me. And when they say, oh, I, who's the, the baddest MF? And then, like, I want my name to, to come up. You, you mentioned earlier the amazing influences, whether it was on mm-hmm. the indie scene, in AEW. And it sounds like there were a lot of fingerprints on your career that really helped to elevate you. Was there was there one guy and and we talked about TV? You said you sat down and watched, but from the indies to being on television is a drastic change. Was there one guy that may have set you up to say, "Hey, you know, uh, being on the indies is one thing. Being in a AEW television program is totally different," and may have gave you those I, I don't know footsteps to to lead you into success. I've been told that by quite a few people. Indie wrestling is deep different from TV wrestling. Indie wrestling, you don't really have to worry about this because there aren't a lot of cameras. Um, advice that has stuck out to me is you want the people in the in the arena to feel that emotion. Or you want the people at home to, to cringe and do something. It's like when I did uh, when Dante Martin went for that suicide dive and I caught him right by the throat and I threw him into the pole. You know, I had my, I had my grandma watch that match with me and I was just staring at her, looking out of the corner of my eye just to see her action. She went like that. So I want people at home to feel everything that I do in that ring. I want them to feel it. Whether it's if I, if I snarl, I want them to kind of like, back up a little bit or want them to smile i want everything i do i want them to feel i want them to feel feel the pain i'm that i'm kicking somebody's ass like i really want them to feel that and and i have fun doing that and so i know the people in the arena are feeling it but it's what about the people are watching it so that that's a goal that was not a goal that's some that's my intent i should say when i when i'm in the ring well, psychology is 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 a gigantic part of professional wrestling, in my opinion. Yes, yes. And I think, and I think in professional wrestling, that is the key component. I feel like a lot of wrestlers draw from different kinds of ways or different sorts of other forms, maybe other forms of media to kind of like maybe help with that psychology, whether it be mm-hmm. movies or TV shows and or prof- other professional wrestlers. Where do yeah. you draw from? Where do you get that kind of that thing from. I, from certain movies certain movie characters i draw from but most of it's just from my from my personal experience like growing up you know a lot of like a lot of the pain i went through growing up as a child like i think of that <laughs> i think of that stuff when i'm in there right you know it's just i don't want to go back to any of that and you know i just i i draw from my own personal experiences well life. i mean with well, that being said, I'm sorry, I want to piggyback. Then has there been moments where the emotion has overcome you to a point where it becomes less of a work and more of a shoot? Um, no, because I, I, I can control it. Um, you know, there's, I think uh, I, did, I did see a whole lot of red, that match that I had with uh, Keith Lee, like that aftermath, like it was... It, it was go. It was it was time to to show out, and it, it took a lot to put him through that table. But I, I had to draw from from somewhere. So, but I do I do know how to control that on and off switch. Well, because you got guys like Eddie Kingston. Sorry to keep going, but I mean this is oh, no very interesting to me. Guys like Eddie Kingston that there's you know who who's been a guest on the show who says that there's a fine line for him. It's he teeters on it. And at some points it goes back and forth into, you know, a real life emotion feeling, boom, it's in the moment and it's real. 
to the other part where, okay, we're working here. So that was- Yeah, kind of I mean, I've, I've, there's, there's kind of been moments where I just, I thought it was just so much like hurtful shit that I just kept going and going and, and popping a guy and popping a guy then you realize, okay, well, we're working. So then you gotta kind of tone it down a little bit, kind of turn that dial down. Mm. It, it seems like a theme over the past month, maybe, especially with Vinny and now you is Bay Area wrestling and listening to interviews, you talking about the Cow Palace, being able to wrestle there, seeing shows there. Mm. Is that like a sentimental moment? Do you do you kind of get sentimental at those kind of experiences because you go from a fan to now in a venue being, you know, one of the bigger stars there? And Bay Area not getting the respect it deserves on a grander stage in wrestling coming from there. Yeah. I mean, I, I, two shows I did for APW, um, and shout out to Marcus Mack, um, that he, excuse me, um, lined me up on those shows at the Cow Palace, like mm -hmm. just going there with my grandparents and just wishing that they could have been there to watch me actually perform in this building where we've seen so many matches uh, um that that's that's so so special to me and just being from the bay area i i, I think bay area wrestling doesn't get enough credit because there's been some top performers that should be well known that have came out of here i think one of the the top tag teams I've ever seen was the, the Reno scum. You know, I, those guys are awesome. Can't say yes. enough good things about those guys. Like they, they, they should be somewhere. Yeah. I'm, I'm in 100% agreeance to you. And if I remember correctly, you did that super show with Cody was headlining at that time. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Co Cody was yeah. yeah main event in that yeah. Yeah, cage match. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And I was there and I remember, just the atmosphere in there was like an old WWF, uh, yeah. you know, show that from the, from the eighties, but, and that was the, I mean, cause that building just breeds that history. It just, it just breeds it, you know, and there's pictures yeah. on the wall of Hogan and Kurt Henning. And, you know, you think about the Bay area and, you know, not only the unsung heroes like a Vinnie Massaro or Reno scum or Mike modest. I mean, Mike modest and Donovan Morgan, when you mentioned those two guys, I mean, we're, they, they, you know, they were both successful in Japan and, and mm -hmm. other everywhere else, but kind of here in a weird way, you know, yeah. I mean, Mike and, and it meant so much more, especially like having Pat Patterson there for that first show, uh -huh. you know, who helped like build the wrestling scene at the Cow Palace. So that, that's that, right. just, that, that popped it off. Yeah. Well, I, I guess for, for, for me, it's, it's, you know, the Bay area, you know, and also the, the Samoans, you know, they're yeah, all yeah. the mission district so yeah. how do you make your mark as a bay area guy like i mean how do you do it how do you want to do it because i mean honestly you're a big guy so you're always going to be like kind of the brute kind of you know brawler type but you move you move like a bam bam you you move very you're like a cat as a big guy so i mean is, is that something that you were consciously like going okay I'm a big guy. I can just clobber the dude, or I can be more like a Bam Bam. Was that more of your what what you want set out to be when you first started getting into wrestling? Um, it was more of a I'm an athlete. I I can I can do anything. Um, I've, I've always been athletic. Always been been an athlete. Um, I always like the combination of the big dudes that can beat the hell out of people, but still can can move. You know, I I look at professional football players like linebackers they're big as hell but they could still run a four or five or four or four or whatever they like they they can move and that's that's just me naturally like i've had people tell me just because you know you're 260 pounds you 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 can't run like i can outrun you and i can still hop a <laughs> fence in one leap like don't don't get it twisted like i, I can i'm athletic so it's just just being doing my natural like being athletic you know just doing what i'm doing like i think people do want to see big guys go at it but they still want to see still see a big guy move it doesn't necessarily have to do a 
a moon salt or a Karana or anything like that. It's just the explosiveness. Like you look at Brock Lesnar, how he's athletic as hell and he can just be a big brute. But once he gets up and takes that first step, it's like, okay, it makes it more impactful. It means more. Your spine buster might be the best spine buster I've seen in the last. Tour. Not might be, not might be. It <laughs> is. You know, you know, you know, you know how I know it is because my spine buster is double A approved. That, that's well, how I know. And and you can you can even ask him. Like double A gave me the 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 nod, the approval. Um, I always joked with him. Like I always would grab my grandma's pillows and do the spine buster on the bed so i've had a lot of practice but that that's always been one of my my top favorite moves sorry to cut you off but no no i had, I had to correct you you said might be and then we ain't you know see how i perfected is with my girlfriend i just kind of pick her up there you go i tried dennis, that but you know she yeah but see dennis doesn't dennis doesn't know <laughs> doesn't dennis doesn't know what that is so he'll never know no uh oh when did you realize that spine buster was going to be one of the cornerstones of your arsenal? I was doing it on the indie scene and it, it, it was just pop. And I think it was my, my second match um, in AEW when I was doing enhancement work. I had, uh, I think it was Alex Reynolds with the spine buster. And, you know, those guys said, give me five moves, you can hit 10, 10 times out of 10. And that was the first one that came up. And it's just grabbing a guy, pivoting, turning, that impact. Like, when I got to the back, and, you know, Cody and Dustin were like, that spine buster was good. And then I kind of you know, had to get Arn's approval, and, you know, <laughs> and I got it, so. And that, I mean, you see what my spine, but you see what my spine buster did to Keith Lee? Like, look at that. There hasn't been a spine buster like that since Arn did it to Vader. Ooh, that's a good point. That's a good so, point. Maybe that's why you got the seal of approval. But I, I mean, if Arn, so. Anderson, if Arn Anderson's giving you the nod, then yeah. you're doing something good. You're yeah, doing there's no, there's good. no question to it. Well, before I'm gonna finish up my last question here, you know, I was gonna ask, you know, the travel schedule for you now is obviously a lot different, and it's probably just mm -hmm. gonna continue to get busier and busier and busier. Um, as we all know, the pandemic shut everything down. And now it yeah. seems like <clears throat> all it's the momentum up. is it's picking up. You're doing signings here. You're doing this place there. You're wrestling every night. Like, you know, you're home for one day. You know, are you mentally, do you think, are you mentally prepared for this kind of travel? Yeah, I am. I think I'm getting, getting used to it. Um, I've always heard stories from wrestlers, you know, how the, this travel schedule is um and it never shunned me away from wanting to wrestle i mean it, it comes with the territory you you want to be in this business you're gonna have to travel you know it's sacrifices so but i do try to make it up excuse me when i get home and you got to make sure you have a good support system yeah so i mean it's not just me it's everything at, at home like you know the foundation that keeps everything grounded are you ready to play the game uh you know i'm 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 so well just so you know we, we we've done this game now i, I think i'm I, I heard you won like the last 20 something games in a row that's what yeah, that's what I, birdie told me oh okay well i'm pretty good at this um but i do i do have a question for you just to help me and dennis out yes are you are you consuming your tv shows uh, through like a cable uh, direct TV kind of thing, or are you kind of more of a streamer? I'm more of a streamer. I don't have cable. I mean, I got closest thing I got to cable is maybe Sling TV or Hulu Live. Okay, understood. For the, understood. Most, for the most part, I'm Amazon Prime kind of guy. Okay. All right. Well, it's time for the hottest game in all of wrestling podcast history. It's what is Will Hobbs watching? <laughs> Will Hobbs, there's three rounds. We guess what you are currently watching. We say within a week or two of it. If you finish the series and you're like two weeks out, it still kind of falls within it. 
you know, okay. a month out doesn't really count. And uh, you hand out points if the closer we are to where <laughs> you're watching, like if you're currently watching, we hit it, it's one full point. If you finished it a week or so ago, it's kind of a half point. You get to decide uh, home field advantage. Fredrickson, you're up. Well, you know what? I'm I'm gonna divert the home field advantage to you, Dennis, because oh. we're both Bay Area guys. So it's kind of like you know, you're the visitors. You get to bat first. Well, okay. I'm gonna go like out that. on limb. You threw out Amazon Prime. I'm my first guess, Jack Reacher. No. Oh, God damn it. Well, see, I'm gonna. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, gonna. Can I go give you guys like a little a little hint? I watch. Oh, well, after I, I guess. Uh, I watch a lot of old shows. Like I, I like to, okay. To, I go to the past and, and reminisce. Okay. A little bit. All right, but um, you know, my, I was gonna, you know, maybe I'll say what where my mind was going till a little bit later. So I'm gonna, if you're if you're more of an old show guy, then I'm gonna say you're watching The Simpsons. No. Okay. Yeah. We All get right. really competitive. Like we are oddly right. competitive at this game. I'm I'm going to take my round number two guess. Throwback Martin. Yeah. Whoa! That's, a, that's, a, that's a full point. Anybody knows me, like that, that's that's my show. Like Martin, like that's yeah, that, that's wait. If you got hold on, were you guys talking about this before? Come on. Don't do no. this to me. Well, no, all right, no. All right. I swear. Old shows. Well, you know, I'm gonna. Then I'm gonna. Uh, this is this is gonna be kind of like my uh, my sort of life preserver. You know, ask a friend. I feel because you have small children at home, you might be watching some children's program. Am I? Am yeah, I, I getting do. okay? So yeah, I'm gonna say uh, you're watching some Paw Patrol. Yes, every night. Ah, ah. Every night. <laughs> every night all right i'm i'm on a thread a here point. because now i feel like i have to go with the obvious kids show just to keep up now i'm playing defense here will i'm on a losing streak i need to win here uh i don't feel confident with another throwback show i don't feel confident that you're watching anything current that i could guess uh, I'm going to steal from his idea, and I'm going to say Mickey Mouse Funhouse. No. God damn it. All right. So, Will, since this is the, the time where I can take this one home and get the three, there's no current TV shows that you're watching at all. Not that I've been consistently watching because all I need is a half a point. And the reason why I'm gonna go with this next TV show I'm gonna ask is because of the Bay Area connection, because of a guy that, you know, a lot of people don't really know. Well, maybe they do, maybe they don't, but they always think of him from Florida. But I'm gonna say Young Rock, the, the, the rock show. I just, I just finished, <laughs> I just, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 a, just, I, just, I just caught up on the, the last episode. I just yeah. caught up on that. I, so, just, I, just, I just caught up on that. My, that's the show my my family and I we we watch. Like we we got we we got caught up on that. Well, you know, I mean, is it? I, I mean, thanks for the win. I appreciate it. Um, but I just want to let let everybody know. I mean, I, I don't think a lot. Do a lot of people know that he was a Bay Area guy, born and raised in San Jose? I, I know that. I know that from Roland Alexander because Roland I, Alexander, you know, uh, founder. Of APW used to yep. tell us how we used to babysit uh, young Dewey. <laughs> but but back to this game. I, I if if you were gonna get this wrong, I was gonna throw out something, a show that I'm watching that at the time WWF used to promote on the USA Network. Or notice? No, it, it, they they would promote it. It's it's a lot of people didn't like the show. But I liked it, and I'm not one. I'm on season one, I think episode seven. Uh, what show would it be? Because I've already won, so I don't, I don't. It's insignificant to me. I'm watching Pacific Blue. 
Oh, oh, oh. oh. wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I'm okay. watching Pacific Blue. I don't even know what that's about, but you're finding it good? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's so, it's kind of like, it reminds me of Baywatch. So it's about these, these cops on Santa Monica Beach. They're, you know, they got bicycles. So it's like cops on a bike. So Gotcha. You Fair might enough. like Burn Notice, though. Burn Notice was a good one too that came on after WWE for the longest time. I, I, I do, rem- I do remember it. I know, I know when I tried watching Silk Stockings, and my grandma was like, "Hell no!" <laughs> like, she's like, she's like, like, turn that shit off. Like, oh, no, go to bed. That it's might like, have been the best advice she ever gave you. Yeah, I watch that. I, man. So many times I tried turning the TV on and turning the volume down, but. The, the glare and all the flashes from the TV will wake her up. And it's like, damn. All right. Well, you know what? I want to say something, you know, from the first time that I met you, Will, you had nothing but class. And, you, you know, and you made my little guy who was a little bit intimidated about being at a wrestling show. Nah, he, he's a man. I still remember the picture we took, man. So. Yeah. Well, but I just, you made him so comfortable. And that's why you've always, I think you made a gigantic lasting impression on him. And he is a fan of yours and he loves you to death. And I, and I think, you know, because of your humility and because you were so gentle to him, you know, you, you made him feel really comfortable. And now he wants to go all the time. And I, I think it's a Thank direct you. result that. Uh, having the interaction with you. So I appreciate that because Thank you. It means you know, a lot. You, you, well, you helped me get closer to my child. So I want to just you. let everybody know out there on a personal level, this guy's class and I'm super grateful that you were able to give up the time to come with us and talk with us. No, man, program. of course. I've been wanting to do this show. So awesome. Thank you. Awesome. But thank you, Will. Appreciate it. And I wish you, you all the continued su- success. Will, thank double you. Or, Appreciate it. Double or nothing's coming up on the horizon May 29th. We're still not sure what you're doing. Make sure you get the pay per view. Watch. Yes. Me. AEW to find out what Will Hobbs is doing. And really quick, I saw an interesting trailer that just dropped about the carpool karaoke. Can, can oh, you drop yes. a little? Yes. So I'm in the car with MJF and Ruby Soho and myself. So all I can say is you got three different personalities, three different <laughs> attitudes. I play the parent. I'm breaking up fights. <laughs> I threatened to pull this car over, and that's all I'm saying. <laughs> well, well it, it, it was fun. Say no more. Go out, find that trailer because it is. This might be one of the. It, it highlights how funny you are. If if people don't see it in your snarl, you are. It shows in that. I, I See, really you getting, are you getting all the cool points back with me putting me over like that. I appreciate it. Well, thank appreciate you for helping well. me get that win tonight on this podcast with guess what will <laughs> watch. I truly appreciate the win that I got. But uh, where can people find you on social media? I am on Twitter at true Willie Hobbs. It's W I L W I L L I E, not with a Y. And on uh, Instagram, true underscore will underscore Hobbs. Well, and I'm not on Facebook, so don't don't even look for me. Well, for everybody at home, the podcast is over. We'll say our goodbyes off the air. This is a wrestling perspective. Rate, subscribe, find it, listen, subs- do whatever you do, consume it. Thank you guys so much. Will Hobbs, thank you for spending this evening with us. Of course. Thank you guys.